we have always on Friday at uh, 8.30. Today we have a, a presentation uh, in person, which is so wonderful, uh, that enable us to have a more contacts after seminars and more discussions. Uh, we have a very special guest today, and I will let Caroline to introduce him. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Caroline Menezic, and I'm an MD, now first-year PhD student at Dr. Shostov Pauczewski's lab. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dabarshi Mustafi, MD, PhD. Dr. Mustafi is the Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Washington, and additionally, a pediatric retinal specialist at the Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Mustafi received a bachelor's degree in science and chemistry from the University of Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Mustafi then obtained his doctorate in philosophy degree with distinction in pharmacology, being mentored by our very own Dr. Krzysztof Bocheski at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Mustafi also obtained his doctorate in medicine at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. He then pursued specialty training, having done his internal medicine preliminary year residency at the University Hospitals of Cleveland and completed ophthalmology residency at the University of Southern California. Dr. Mustafi concluded his medical retina and retro retinal surgical fellowship at the University of Washington, Seattle. Dr. Mustafi has a longstanding research activity in the field, focusing on understanding the genome Typic features that contribute to phenotypic presentations of retinal disease. His work has demonstrated the power of transcriptome profiling to reveal distinct coding and non-coding RNA species to reflect the functional state of the retina. This has led to the discovery of novel genes as drivers of phenotypic patterning and disease. He hopes to continue combining careful clinic characterization with genetics and systems level understanding of retinal diseases to review overarching pathways of disease that can be targeted pharmacology. He believes that in an era of advancing genetic diagnoses and evolving therapy, understanding the genetic and functional basis of retinal degenerative diseases will be critical to assess a patient's inclusion in proper therapeutic intervention, especially in the pediatric population. Dr. Mustafi has published numerous peer-reviewed papers, reviews, editorials, book chapters, and has also developed protocols approved for human investigation and has been involved in clinical trials. He is currently a manuscript reviewer for the Invasive Ophthalmology and Visual Science Journal, and also a member of the Association for Research and Vision and Ophthalmology, and a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Without further ado, it is our pleasure to have Dr. Mustafi present his talk for today, titled Mechanisms for Signaling Exoptosis, a New Paradigm in Retinogenetics. Targeted long read sequencing provides rapid phase variant identification to improve diagnostic yield in Mendelian diseases of the retina. Thank you, Caroline, for that. Share my screen. All right. <clears throat> So uh, today I'm going to be talking about, uh, as Caroline pointing out, a new paradigm in retinal genetics. I think that's happening, and that's shifting away potentially from short read sequencing and incorporating long read sequencing. And today, what I'd like to talk to you about is how we're better able to do um, a lot of these uh, tools to hopefully yield a better idea of what's happening in the retina and in Mendelian diseases in general. So no financial disclosure. So. Now I'm going to be talking about a very thin layer tissue that we're all very well aware of, the retina. Um, and what's beautiful about this is that there's a complex interplay of cells here. But most notably, we have the photoreceptors supported by the RPE, and then you have the various levels of um, nuclei and ganglion cells that are then going to support higher order vision in the brain. You can imagine that any disruption along this pathway, whether it be in a photoreceptor, RP, or neighboring cell type, can lead to retinal disease and can eventually lead to blindness. And what we want to understand, though, is how these genetic components are driving disease, because now we're in an era that we can potentially target them. Now, IRDs are generally actually a pretty new 
newer field to Mendelian genetics because we didn't really think retinal diseases were inherited. For the longest time, retinal diseases were thought to be autoimmune in nature, hence the term retinitis pigmentosa, right? So we thought it, was inher it wasn't inherited, you had some autoimmune component, and that went for a really long time. And it really wasn't until 1990 where Tetrodrage's group showed that rhodopsin is a genetic form of disease in the photopigment rods. And that's when we started to think that there must be other reasons that are driving genetic diseases in the eye. Now, within 10 years, the field had moved rapidly. So we were doing clinical trials in dogs for RP65. And then if you look a decade later, the next big breakthrough was not unique to ophthalmology. It's the advent of next generation sequencing. And this provided us with the tool to understand things without having to look at single genes or single regions of a gene. We could look at entire genomes, entire transcriptomes. And we went from a handful of genes to cause retinal disease to a few hundred genes. Now, this 2010 also coincided with my interaction with this fella here. Um, I came in as a, as a young uh, graduate student, younger than now, um, looking to solve protein structures. I had done crystallography as an undergrad, and I wanted to solve protein structures. And I was intrigued because Chris had just solved, or not just solved, had previously solved the GPCR rhodopsin. And he said, well, you know, there's a new mouse model. Uh, Anansar Roots group had just created a knockout of the NRL mouse model. This was, uh, for those who don't know, is a overexpression of s -conopsin. So he said, this, you have a pure form of s in a in a mirroring model, just like I had rhodopsin and for bovine, go and crystallize conopsin. And I thought this was a great project. I did not crystallize conopsin. No one has. Um, and it tells you the intricacies of crystallization, but it did show me that there's other things that are very interesting. And that was understanding why a knockout like NRL or any other gene can lead to disease. So it started me on this path of trying to understand the distinct relationship that exists between a patient's phenotype to their underlying retinal or whatever genotypic presentation they may have. We partnered with the late Sam Jacobson's group to look at, and, and Arthur who's on here too, to look at uh, enhanced s syndrome in human patients and what that looked like. And when we then looked at how it translated to our mouse models, we saw very similar features in outer nuclear layer patterning. And then the big thing we were trying to figure out is how can that transcription factor knockout cause disease? And at the time, the thing that was really emerging, as I mentioned, was next generation sequencing. So we were one of the first labs to do next generation sequencing. So we did the transcriptome of the eye and retina in mouse. Uh, hum or wild type and knockout NRL mouse models, and we start to understand the transcriptional framework that's happening. Now, the beauty of transcriptomes is that it gives you a, a, like a distinct snapshot in time of what's happening because you basically stop the reaction. You've seen every RNA species that is either actively being transcribed and what levels, and you can start to see what is probably contributing to disease. And by looking at these aberrant networks, we could then go back and see, yes, it matched the phenotype of these mice are having abnormal accumulations in the photoreceptor head, which we could show with zero block base electron microscopy. Um, and then understanding that we could take snapshots in time, we thought, can we then understand other physiological processes that are happening in the eye? And one of the processes you wanted to really dissect is photoreceptor turnover or phagocytosis. The RP is the most active phagosome in our body. And the question is what mediates that time dependent burst of phagocytosis versus the trough where nothing is happening. And by examining again the phenotypic features with EM and doing the transcription profile, and we could identify drivers of this process, that it's not necessarily dependent on clock chains like many other things driven by the suprachiasmatic nuclei, but inherit genetic elements in the photoreceptor environment itself. And then finally, what we really were trying to get to is what drives photoreceptor health? and what drives disease. And to understand that, we wanted to see what's needed in a cone environment versus a rod environment. And there are many mouse models and other things that can allow you to look at that, but we thought, how can we do this in a physiological way? Can we understand what the physiological rod needs and a physiological cone needs? And to do that, we looked at species. So there are species that have, through evolution, uh, basically adapted to different photoreceptor environments. We have our, um, uh, rat and mouse here that are rod enriched nocturnal species. And then you have on the other end, cone enriched uh, Nile grass rats and, and um, ground squirrels. So we're able to get all these and show that they have different 
retinoid metabolism and profiles to support these different things. And then we did an exhaustive uh, transcriptome study where we did de novo assembly of these transcriptomes to identify what is expressed in rod versus cone rich environments um, in the retina. Um, and by looking at um, whole genome network analysis, we could identify those genes that were more likely more associated with rod versus cone pathways. And we went one step further and we looked at what happens when you look at very discrete sections of a retina. So in a primate retina, what does a macula express versus what does the peripheral retina express? And how does that connect to what we had identified for rod versus cone signaling? And this allowed us to lay the fr uh, framework for what is likely the disease genes that would be mutated. And then if we do identify a disease gene, a new one, we can potentially say, well, this is more likely a cone pathway that will be um, changed and give some prognostic information. And that brings me back to the IRD. So as I mentioned, there has been a boom of uh, understanding of what we have done since the 2010s because of next generation sequencing. But what is still lacking is that we cannot look at a person clinically to tell them what they have. And that's because of the genetic heterogeneity. Um, the example I always use is USH2A, which is <laughs> known to cause retinitis pigmentosa. Um, sorry. And not only can it cause isolated retinitis pigmentosa, but it can also cause syndromic disease called Usher syndrome. So these people are poor with um, hearing loss from birth and then develop RP over time. And there is no difference in the sense that it's not like they have a different form of gene, it's the same gene, it's just the variant. So we've gone from understanding the genetic level to now trying to understand the variant level uh, disease features so that we can better understand what the phenotype will be. And as we'll talk about what the treatment will be. So, you know, marching on from the 2010s, the biggest change in that in the next uh, decade has been treatment. So we've gone from doing clinical trials to actually doing this first in humans. So in 2017, we had Luxerna Ratagene injected into the eye uh, to show that RP65 is a viable alternative for patients suffering from LCA. And then a different form of LCA had the first in vivo clinical correction trial in 2020. Uh, for SEP290. Um, and as we know with Chris's work with base editing and other labs, you know, the next evolution is going to be more targeted therapy to get patients the hopefully the vision restoration or um, kind of maintenance that they uh, can maintain over time. So, you know, how do we go about IRD clinical diagnostics? So I'd like to walk you through kind of what I do in clinic and then how I hope that uh, we can change what we're doing to better provide diagnoses for these patients. So, you know, I think it all starts with a very good clinical diagnosis. And I think um, a good clinical diagnosis can narrow down your genetic uh, etiology very well, but it's not that it can narrow it down to one gene usually. So you still have, if you have RP, that's 80 genes. Still. So, you know, you can exclude a lot, but you still have not narrowed yourself down enough to give them a diagnosis. So, you know, we use genetic testing to provide that more definitive molecular diagnosis for the next step. Now, there are a few variations that you can get when you set up genetic testing. I think the most slam dunk answer is when you get a, a genetic mutation in a disease known to cause autosomal dominant disease. One variant is enough, um, and it can be de novo, or you can trace it through their family. And the next one is uh, autosomal recessive with uh, homozygous mutations, meaning both, both the genes are affected by the same variant. Um, and again, these do not require you to phase a person in that you don't, it doesn't matter on what chromosome it is because one or both are equally affected. The next one is when you have an autosomal recessive disease, but you have heterozygous variants, meaning you have two variants that are different on each copy of the gene. Now, in this case, what really does matter is what is the phase of these variants? Are they indeed on opposite chromosomes? Do they lie in cis to each other? Because let's suppose you don't phase them and they happen to lie cis and you then correct one of these you might not correct their gene mutation because they have either a third variant or worse, they have a completely different genetic etiology. So phasing these is very important that I'll talk about. And then we fall into this non-diagnostic criteria. So a person with autosomal recessive disease with only one variant um, in a known disease causing gene and then non-diagnostic. So you may get something that says, we found a lot of variants of unknown significance, but nothing known to be pathogenic. So unfortunately, between 40 to 50% of patients fall into this non-diagnostic criteria. 
And the number is even higher because we are not actively phasing these individuals in clinic. So oftentimes we'll get a patient with two variants that are heterozygous and a known disease causing gene and they fit the clinical profile and we close the book. But we actually haven't closed the book because we have not shown that those are the only two variants and they do it indeed lie in trans. And this brings me back to the slide. What we still are trying to understand are not only the genetics behind it, but also how these variants are arranged um, allelic wise so that we can think about correction. <laughs> and I love this figure that um, Susie and Chris's lab published in the DNA a few years ago. Um, the future is that once we identify things, we can move forward to treatment, right? So you get a mutation, you then can design things for genome editing. We have the ability with patient-derived stem cells to test, the, uh, test that, uh, treatment in the patient's uh, stem cells themselves to see what the effect would be, and then ultimately develop that as a deliverable agent for delivery that we've shown is viable, whether it's through the intravitreal or subretinal or suprachoroidal now. You can imagine that the central, one of the first cogs in the system is variant identification, and we're not great at that. Like I said, 30 to 40 percent of patients get a non-diagnostic result. So this limits the ability for patients to be enrolled in trials, be enrolled in FDA approved therapy that comes along besides our P65, and it stops this whole pipeline moving forward. We can't design something for someone who we don't know the variants are. So this is the pathway that most of us follow as clinicians. We have a, a patient that walks in and we have a few different options in front of us. We can either do target panel sequencing, exome sequencing, or genome sequencing. Now the most common approach that we take as clinicians is targeted panel sequencing, meaning that there's a curated panel of coding exons and maybe some non-coding elements that we are then going to look at. And this is really good at catching variants in coding regions. So in this case, if you have a disease gene one and you, and you have a variant in exon two, you're going to catch it with your targeted panel sequencing. But if there's a panel, if there's a gene that's not on your panel, unfortunately, like gene two, you're going to miss it completely. And you're going to give the patient a non-diagnostic result even though they have a variant in a disease gene. Alternatively, if you do test gene one, but you have an intronic variant uh, or structural variant or something that's not well covered, you're also going to return a non-diagnostic uh, result. Now, exome sequencing raises the bar in that you are getting all coding regions, but you're still missing a lot of the intronic variants and structural variants that are these missing heritability 20 to 30 percent. And then in the last uh, example is genome sequencing. Genome sequencing is going to cover every base, right? So you, you think that, okay, this is the best solution. Why don't we do genome sequencing for everyone? It's extremely expensive. And I don't mean monetarily because the price <coughs> is going down, but the time and effort for one to analyze the genome sequencing data is immense. And you know, people who advocate for do, doing genome sequencing on everyone has never spent the time actually taking that data and trying to analyze it. Because you need the most high powered GPUs to even process that data, to map it to a reference, and then to wade through that to identify things is, is massive. The other thing is all known IRD disease causing loci constitute less than 2% of our genome. So when you do a whole genome study, 98% of your time for sequencing effort and analysis is wasted on things that you do not need. So, you know, as I mentioned, large scale studies from the US and UK have shown that 30 to 40% get a non-diagnostic result. So how can we get this better? Well, part of the problem is that we're not very good at uh, sending panels off. So, you know, when, when I started the uh, Peds Retina Division at Children's, um, we started an IRD clinic with genetics and we sat down and thought, what test should we be sending? Because if you, if you just log in and, and Google IRD gene panel, you will find companies, 10, 20 companies making IRD gene panels. So which one do you send? Well, they're not all created equal. And these are the top three that our hospital system had been sending. And you can see that out of about 350, about 270 genes are encompassed by all three. But that means that each gene, every panel has 30 to 40 genes that are unique. So if you send off panel A, but your gene happens to fall in panel B, you've just returned that patient a non-diagnostic result, right? Uh, we had a uh, patient uh, last week that I saw referred in from a, a different practice. So they had a panel test that did not encompass the gene. And then they had trio exome sequencing, meaning mom, dad, and child had exome sequencing done, all to find out that the kid had RPGR mutation. Um, and the reason this was not found because the initial panel did not sequence open reading gram 15, which is the hot spot for mutations, right? But a correct panel choice would have provided this family an answer 
Instead, they went on a diagnostic odyssey for six months, uh, only to find out that they had a gene that had a variant in a gene that is the most prevalent form of X-linked RP in kids, um, all because the wrong test was sent. So we have to be better about sending testing off. And the other thing that we have to do is we have to phase patients. So there's a, there's a phase problem in Mendelian disease where when we use short reads, we're not able to provide phase information. So we know in autosomal recessive, we must inherit these uh, variants most likely, or there's de novo uh, mutations. But when we get these mutations, we do not actually know if they lie in cis or on the same chromosome or in trans. And we need to know this because this dictates whether they're actually gonna have disease or not, right? And whether this is the answer to the question that they have. And to show that they're in trans, what we normally use is familial segregation. So what does that mean? So this is a patient of mine that has uh, H2A related disease. Uh, and we, we sequenced the patient and we found two deleterious mutations in the H2A gene. But we have no idea if they're on the same chromosome or not. Now we can assume that they do um, because they have disease, but I don't know if you wanna try start this patient on therapy or do a clinical trial based on assumption, right? So how do we verify this? Well, we can look at mom or we'll look at dad and look at mom and they each have a variant. So that means that they inherited each, so they must be on different chromosomes. So we have demonstrated that they're in a trans configuration. But let's take this same example. We find two variants, we sequence dad, and we sequence mom, and mom does not have the other variant. We have no idea, right? So de novo mutations cannot be phased using familial segregation because most likely this de novo occurred on the second chromosome. We actually don't know, right? So um, you'll have to use different uh, approaches to figure this out. So, you know, the current sequ sequencing methods, I think, are wonderful. You know, short reads have given us a boom in terms of what we can discover. But I think there are things that we can still do with different methodologies. Now, the biggest restrictions are, for now, when we do gene panels, we're only looking at coding regions. They don't encompass everything, as we showed. They're dependent, panel dependent. Um, Non-coding regions are poorly covered, and as we're finding out, that's important for driving disease. Modifications of these panels are difficult. So a lot of these use bead-based or some hybridization technique, um, and it's not easy for them to modify a panel. And I know this because if you if they ever modify a panel and they add a new gene, they'll send an email to their entire list host saying, hey, we added a new gene, which should not be a, um, a big, big news, but it is because it takes a lot of effort. And the other thing I just talked about is that we cannot phase variants. So even when we identify these, we have not fully diagnosed these individuals. Um, a lot of this can be overcome with long read sequencing, which we'll talk about today. Long read sequencing kind of came about in the last 10 years or so. Um, it became more of a thing in the last five years as technologies improved. But excuse me, what long read sequencing is able to do is fill in the gaps essentially. So uh, take this gene with multiple exons. You know, short reads are basically going to scaffold this with really short segments. Think about doing a 500 piece puzzle. You know, it's going to be hard to find every piece very easily. You're going to need a lot of good scaffolds to actually put the edges together. And then long reads have really long reads, so you have less scaffolds. So you turn that 500 piece puzzle into a five piece puzzle. So you're able to really see large pieces and put things together. And what this allows you to do is identify non-unique sequences because you span these regions, identify repeat expansions because instead of just putting the same repeat in an area, you'll know that they're anchored in different areas. Look at structural variants very clearly. And I think most importantly, as I'll talk about is phase variants because you can show that one variant is in trans to another based on how other variants are anchored. So back to this slide, you know, I think a lot of these things can be overcome with genome sequencing, right? So we can identify structural variants, we can identify non-coding regions, but as I just told you, it's incredibly onerous on the person who takes this on, right? But what I'd like to talk about today is how we're able to develop a method to do targeted genome sequencing. So those 2% of the genome that covers all IRD genes, we can selectively sequence. We don't have to sequence the other 98% of genes. And in doing so, we can get enriched data, fully phased, to provide a diagnosis. Um, it's also incredibly quick. So a uh, sequencing run can be done within 12 hours to produce output data within a day. So I'll start the story by talking about H2A-related uh, disease. So uh, it's a disease I see quite often in clinic, but it causes two things, as I mentioned, Usher, Usher syndrome, which is syndromic, and non-syndromic retinitis pigmentosa. It's a very large gene. It's almost 800,000 base pairs. It's complex. It has 72 exons. 
Um, there's incredible urgency to identify variants because you know, we've started to develop therapies. There's an exon skipping therapy that was um, brought to clinical trials and hopefully many more on the way. But in the grand scheme of things, it's actually a very small gene in the sense that our genome is 6 billion base pairs. So this large gene actually encompasses less than 0.01% of total DNA. So when you do a whole genome sequencing run, let's say you're looking for a missing heritable non-coding or structural variant, 99.9% .9 of sequencing time is wasted in a sense, right? And then when you have to analyze that data, you are analyzing 0.01% of your data, which is not the most efficient way to do it. So um, I'm gonna talk about a technology that um, was developed by Oxford Manipur uh, that has, we have kind of hijacked for our use of um, IRD diagnostics. The way ONT basically is designed their machine is that they use a protein nanopore. And you know DNA is charged based on the base pair and each base pair has a fundamentally different charge. And the way this system works is using a motor protein DNA is thread through a protein nanopore. And every piece of DNA, every base that goes through elicits a change in current. That current is very small, it's a picoamp current. So it can't tell you if it's an A or G right away, but what it can do is it can sum those that squiggle together and we use uh, deep learning convolutional uh, neural networks to then uh, kind of decode that signal to tell us what those string of bases are. Now, um, this is all done on a flow cell that fits in the size of your hand. So that's the other thing is that these instrumentations that we have been using are giant benchtop machines, but this is inherently mobile, can be moved and can be used in clinics and other things like that. Um, one of, the, one of the nice things about being a young assistant professor is that I've had to work at the bench again. So after eight years away uh, from the bench, I've been forced to go back. Um, but at the same time, what's nice about that is that it has forced me to learn this new technology and also learn what is good and bad about it, right? So to troubleshoot it. Um, and what we found is that this device, although fits in the size of your palm, requires a machine that big to really run it. So, we use two NVIDIA RTX 6000s with a Threadripper, um, which are two very powerful GPUs to run um, our uh, sequencing runs. But this enables us to do things in real time. So we can read bases in real time and decide if we want to sequence something or not. Um, and we use um, deep learning pipelines to then analyze that data and output variant files to basically decode whether this person has a, a mutational that is sufficient for disease or not. So kind of in a nutshell, what we do is we put DNA on the flow cell. Um, and in this example, the green channels up top are things that we can bioinformatically control. So what we input is a BET file of genomic data. And we say, I want you to target H2A. So in the top, what's going to happen is that when DNA is thread through, DNA is read about 450 bases per second in the system. After about five to 800 bases, it's going to make a decision. It's going to say, is this piece of DNA that I've just read Aligned to H2A? And if the answer is yes, it'll keep reading that piece of DNA. If the answer is no, it will then reverse polarity and kick it out. And in doing so, you are basically only sequencing the genes that you want, right? And the bottom panel, the blue channels, are ones that you are not controlling. So these are channels that um, will basically sequence everything that comes along. It has no control on it. So when you do that, so when you split your cell up 50 50, for example, these non-enriched blue channels, control channels, you're gonna get coverage of your gene just by chance, right? 90.01% of the time. You're gonna get very low level coverage. It's not gonna be sufficient to make a diagnosis. It's not gonna be sufficient to even cover the gene. When you are able to enrich this just on half your channels, you get a 15X bump. So you go from not covering your gene to covering it 15X. And then when you put your full flow cell targeting your gene, you get between 20 and 30X coverage more than enough to phase and provide IRD diagnostics. What I've not talked about is the cost. The cost of this entire run that we do from start to finish is under $500, which rivals what a whole genome sequencing run is for most places, which is over 2000. A targeted panel, for example, costs $2,500 most of the time. So, you know, I'll kind of give this example of how we do this in USH2A. So this is a, a family where both siblings are affected an unaffected mother, a uh, father who unfortunately passed away. Genetic testing had shown they had two variants in H2A, had not phased them. Uh, the beauty again is we can fully cover the gene. We can 
fully separate those reads into maternal and paternal haplotypes. And then we can look and show that, yes, these two variants on neighboring exon six and seven do indeed lie in trans. So it's, um, there's a single nucleotide variant in subject one on the top yellow haplotype, and in the bottom haplotype in the blue one, you have this two-base pair deletion, both known to be pathogenic. So you have clearly shown with one sequencing run that these patients not only have the mutation, but they lie in trans, right? Now we did the whole family to kind of show proof of concept, but you wouldn't have to sequence mom. You wouldn't have to sequence sister to figure out things, right? Um, and we did show that if you did not know what was going on, um, by looking at what, G, what variants are in common between these three, you would narrow down from an H2A, you get about a thousand variants in, in a normal individual. Um, you narrow it down to about 12 to 15. So even without knowing a priori what was going on, you would be able to narrow down to a sizable number to then do potential cell-based studies to prove your hypothesis is correct. <clears throat> the biggest caveat, I think, for long read sequencing is its accuracy. Uh, when I started, you know, many people have told, have told me, well, long reads are not accurate, right? So you're going to get a lot of uh, errors. So how do you know what you're finding is actually true? And this was based on a paper in 2018. So um, this paper had said that long reads are accurate, but not that accurate when compared to the reference short read data that they were looking at. And the accuracy was low. It was 88% for long reads. The short reads are 99.9%. So can you really justify using something that's in the 80s when you have something that's 99%, right? Well, so we looked at our data to see how true is that? You know, it's come a long way since 2018, and actually that's not true. So what is true is that long reads and short reads are going to call variants differently, but they identify the same underlying sequence. So here's an example. You have a reference sequence in gray in the middle, and you have your output from nanopore that says that you have a one base pair deletion and then a five base pair deletion and then a single nucleotide variant. Illumina says you have a seven base pair deletion and an insertion. So you have 0% concordance, right? So your long reads are garbage. But according to this metric, right? They do not match. But the output reference is the exact same. And the reason we have been wrong in comparing these two is that long <coughs> short reads are so use a completely constant. different cost function when they're lining things. They use GATK or Genome Analysis Toolkit, and they're going to basically look at this reference and align that because the cost function for those short reads are inherently different than what long reads are. So when you actually do a variant context matching method, the concordance between these two methods are 98% uh, that we showed on the same patient run with the same sample on two different platforms. And actually, when you really break it down, you get a higher precision F1 score for variant discovery with long read sequencing. And that's because long reads are able to cover everything that short reads cannot. So there's this big gap here where long reads have coverage between 20 and 30 X and short reads have zero to no coverage. And that's where your difference really lies because there's no long read area below 18 X coverage for a short read area. And a lot of it is because in this example here, long reads are able to really span these intronic regions really nicely. Um, this is the same sample run on short reads, and you can see that these white reads are low-quality reads, so it can't quantify if that's a variant or not. The other thing that you know, we were able to quickly do is reassign variants of unknown significance. So a lot of the times, the last clinical kind of step that you need to prove these are uh, whether they lie in trains or not. And this is very simply able to be done now, um, this is a patient with H2A again, where we're able to show that two variants lie in trans to reassign and give them a complete molecular diagnosis. Now, <clears throat> I just spent the beginning part of the talk telling you that there's a huge clinical heterogeneity and genetic heterogeneity of IRDs. Um, and we, we've demonstrated what we can do really well for one gene, right? But knowing it, no, most diseases are not one single gene. So what is the point of selecting one gene? We really need to select all of them. So um, having proven that, that we could do one gene, we've now expanded to multiple genes. So instead of just doing disease gene one, we can do two genes, three genes, actually we can do hundreds of genes. So I'm gonna show an example of how we've now been able to do this entire experiment, not just targeting one gene, um, but targeting every known IRD disease loci in our genome. So, you know, basically, what we're able to do is we're able to, again, get selective targeting of every gene that we want. 
So on the top panel here um, is a whole genome run on the ONT platform. So you, you will get, again, coverage, but low coverage of whatever disease gene that you're looking at. And this is a targeted run. And I've highlighted the targeted regions to show that we're getting 20x coverage of these targeted regions and negligible coverage outside of that, right? Um, and the beauty of that is not only do you get coverage, but that allows you to phase. So this is a, a patient with rhodopsin uh, mutation. So we're able to show that it clearly segregates on a single haplotype uh, in the long read sequencing data, but not so clear in the short read data. Now, the other thing is that because of depth, you're able to make diagnoses, right? So again, with whole genome data, you're, you will get depth potentially, but you'll have to do multiple runs or very concentrated runs. But in this example, we show that in some areas with your whole genome run, you're gonna get almost no coverage versus um, in your targeted run, you will get great depth of coverage that allows you to haplotype in the bottom panel. And then um, finally, the other thing that we can do is, you know, we wanted to show that when we expand from single genes to multiple genes, we're not losing depth. So it's not like we have now divided our depth from one to 300 something, right? We are getting the same amount of depth because we're still sampling equivalently. So in the top example is when we only targeted H2A, we targeted a larger region of that locus. But when we target H2A again as part of this panel, we still get the same depth of coverage. <clears throat> now, this this did enable the, this did allow, uh, have to make us relook at the genome assembly. And I thought I'd just put this in because sometimes we don't get great data and it's not because of the patient, not because of our sequencing run, it's because of the reference that we're using. So there are inherent issues with the human genome reference that I wanna bring up. And you know, one thing when we targeted is that you know, we would expect a certain number of reads to fall based on the size of that gene. And you can see these, um, hard to see, but there's some, uh, dots in red that are to the left of the line there, and those were not getting covered well. So we looked at those in detail, and I highlight three. Um, NRL is one of them, and then um, OCA2 is the other one. And basically what was happening is they were, they were not mapping because there are regions of the genome that are duplicated that were better um, mapped somewhere else. So by fixing those and masking those regions, we can now be able to get our panel to work perfectly well, and we imagine as we do this for the whole uh, genome, we'll be able to uncover other duplicated areas and mask them as well. And this is what the ultimate output looks like. So the bottom line is basically your background signal. So you get one, two X coverage of your background, and then you have between 20 and 25 X from a single sequencing run of your of depth of coverage of all your IRD known loci. Now in the middle here, you know, you're wondering, oh, why is this one half the other one? Well, we know this is a male this is a X chromosome read. So um, it also kind of is an inherent control for us to know what that read is. Is it a male or a female knowing beforehand and seeing if that matches our output. Um, you know, and then you know, I'd like to just show a few examples before my time's done here. Um, one of them that um, I'll talk about, but Tucker talked about this a few weeks ago is Batten's disease. It's a, unfortunately a terrible um, metabolic disease in kids that can prematurely end their lives and lead to vision loss. But, you know, we came across this family that had two siblings that had very atypical form and that I saw the oldest kid when he was 18, which is a lot of a lot the age where most of them have either severe neurocognitive decline or have unfortunately passed away. Um, and he was doing very well. He was just having vision problems for the first time in his life. Um, and we looked at the ERGs, in this case, they're subjects seven and eight. You could see that they're relatively well preserved versus two other subjects who are much younger who have almost flat ERGs. And when we looked at their OCTs and um, when we looked at their fundus photos, they had clear macular phenotypes, but very late onset. So we wanted to understand what was going on. Um, we worked with Ron Sebasin's lab to show that they have dysfunction at the level of photoreceptor, but not to the extent you would expect from someone with TPP1 variants. Um, so we sequenced this family to identify what was going on. Uh, and we ended up finding that they have one known coding variant, but the second variant in this family was a non-coding variant, likely a splice site variant that was maybe hypomorphic um, and it segregated. So we also sequenced parents just to be safe to make sure, but they both each harbored one of the two variants. And with uh, King of Bojakowski's labs, uh, Mass Ioneer, we were able to show that compared to normal allele, the, the, the alternate allele, basically the non-coding variant, 
allowed retention of some of that product. So that makes sense as to why this patient had an atypical presentation, but also shows the power of identifying these with variants. So by identifying the second variant, we're able to then narrow down what our cell culture-based work would be. And I think that's the beauty of this technique is that we can phase it to narrow down what the second hypomorphic variant could be so we get better investigated. <laughs> the other thing that we can start to do is deconvolute complex variants. So um, in the simplest example, we have two variants that cause disease, one in haplotype one and one in haplotype two. But there are many diseases, the most common that I can think of is ADCA4 related Stargardt, where there could be three, four variants, right? And it matters what's in cis and trans because of the hypomorphic variant nature of these things. Um, we first validated this, so we looked at a family again with US2A, we showed that siblings on the bottom two have one variant um, here in red, and then a deletion and another variant in green. So they have three variants, two in cis, one in trans, and sure enough, the father had two of them in cis, while the mother had one in uh, uh, one uh, as well. So it makes perfect sense, but it showed that without having sequenced the family, we also would have been able to resolve that allelic architecture. And we then use this to try to understand different kind of phenotypic presentations for ABCA4. So this is a patient, uh, very young, uh, 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 patient in his teens with reduced vision, and you can see clearly a uh, very advanced disease with um, on fundosotal fluorescence of the macula. And then when we look, they have three variants. They have a hypomorphic variant, this ALA 1038 valine, but it's in cis to another severe variant. And then on in trans to that is another severe variant. So you essentially have two severe variants in one hypomorph, but it doesn't matter what that hypomorph is doing because that other allele is already severely affected. Now compare that to this patient. This is a patient um, in their 40s with very mild disease, also with ABCA4 related disease. They happen to have two hypomorphic variants that happen to lie in cis. So that um, allele is essentially not normal, but close to normal. And in trans, there's a severe, a severe allele. So even though allele number two is severely affected, allele number one is you know, trucking along as best as it could. And in doing so, allowing them not to have that abnormal accumulation over time. Um, and again, we can see that when we do identify these variants, Phasing is so important. It's a family where, unfortunately, it's adopted and we cannot phase variants, but it's very wants to know is this the form of disease? And again, very easily we can show they're in trans and then reassign that BUS into something pathogenic to provide a full molecular diagnosis. Um, so, you know, as I've talked about, the traditional pathway has been IRD panel testing. You get your initial results. You then try to drag family members in, do further genetic counseling, do familial segregation and get your base result. And this can take months, it can take years, depending on availability of familial DNA, um, but we can reduce that time. So this is a patient that uh, I saw in clinic who had just sent off clinical testing. And we said, well, why don't we enroll you in our study and figure out what's going on? <laughs> um, and we, had, we were able to very conclusively show he had two variants in trans and the H2H disease gene. So we essentially have deleted these steps, right? So you go from IRD <laughs> panel testing to complete diagnosis. And then we wanted to push the envelope to see how quick can we make this diagnosis? Is it, is it hours, days, weeks? Because a, a term or time for clinical testing is sometimes four to eight weeks, maybe longer, right? Uh, turns out it's hours. So we looked back at our data post hoc and saw as the reads come in, when did we have the phase set? Or when can we conclusively say variants are in trans? And when we build that, we see that at hour 12, we have not only identified the two variants with the red lines, but that blue line is the face set. How comfortably can we say these two variants are on different face sets? And at hour 12, we've been able to show that these two variants are indeed present at a, at a depth that we would recognize and they are correctly phased or phased to be on in trans. So 12 hours into a sequencing run, you've had your answer. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to see, is this the answer for these non-coding missing heritability projects? So, uh, this is a sample that was sent to us of a patient with H2A. Not sure why there's random lines on the screen there. Someone's drawing on here. Um, but uh, we we had a, we had a patient with a known coding variant here in red, um, and then we did not. They did not have a second hit. And these are the, those 30 to 40 percent that are floating around without a second hit, right? So basically, what we did is we did our same run. We did a sequencing run. We narrowed down our variants and out pops variant number two 
which is a known pathogenic non-coding variant. It doesn't exist in most panels. There are a few panels that in, incorporate non-codings. This is not one of them. So this patient would have had to undergo genome sequencing, likely, to find this result. And as I just talked about, that is an immense undertaking for something that we could identify in a very short targeted run. And then the other thing is identification of complex structural variants. So uh, this is a patient with, again, h 2 related disease that from initial sequencing, it was unclear if they had a structural variant or not. So we were able to show that they indeed do. They have a, um, they have a known pathogenic coding mutation and in trans, a enormous structural variant in, encompassing two exons, right? Now we did genome sequencing, a uh, short read side by side. And what we're able to sh show is that sure enough with genome sequencing, you, sh you, can, you don't phase them, but you could conclude that this is likely a head variant. But it's very difficult. It's not easy to tell what the precise breakpoints are. That's because you're not gonna span this, right? So you might have reads that are clipped, but you really have to go back into GATK to really find where those clippings occur and whether you can reliably call a breakpoint or not. Um, here, there's no question. We know the exact breakpoint. We can identify that breakpoint very precisely. Um, and this is another example of identifying precise breakpoints, but this is interesting for a different reason. So this is a patient with CEP78 related rod cone dystrophy, um, who also had a large structural variant that was unclear. So we sequenced in the phase then that they do indeed lies in trans to this no non-coding variant. But what was interesting is that when it was initially sent to us, they said, they think it's deletion of exon one through four. Um, and it's a little larger than that. And it's actually quite larger. So if you look at where this deletion goes, this is exon one, it's quite a bit upstream of exon one, right? So you're not gonna ever get your precise breakpoints even from exome panel data because you're not gonna encompass those regions. The other thing that we were, that I did not mention uh, about this approach is that because we are looking at every base, we can look at modifications in real time. So we can look at methylation all in the same sequencing run. So this is the same person with CEP78 disease, but now we have colored the bases by methylation signal. So the biggest thing that pops out is that there are two large hypomethylated regions in blue. Um, and I put them in gray. And what's very interesting is that we've now looked back and see, look back to see, does it align with known signals um, of histone modification um, and accessibility with a taxi? And we have these available from Tim Cherry's data um, and it aligns perfectly. So. Um, SEP78, that signal is exactly aligned to the peak stray taxique and histone modifications. And we happen to catch this other gene, PSAP1, just because it's in our overhang of how we target. Um, and those regions also capture it. So all in one experiment, you're able to get real-time data, phasing, methylation, structural variant calling um, in a very rapid format. <laughs> and then, you know, we've done this in a large cohort to show that, you know, this is kind of real-world experiments that you get uh, coverage anywhere between 15 to 40 X based on your flow cell and DNA quality. Um, and your read lengths can vary from seven, 7,000 to about 15 to 20,000, depending on the size. Um, and on the, on the right there of the slide, it's just showing that when we look across chromosomes and across read lengths, across these studies, there's no bias. We're not inducing any bias. It's like a digital karyotype that shows that the control of our experiment is correct. <clears throat> So in conclusion, what we're able to show is that targeted long sequence provides comprehensive information contributing to the disease. There's a rapid turnaround time from the point we get the sample to actually get um, an answer. Um, and I think as clinical trials progress, this will be very important. Now, one thing that's important is that, you know, we get very quick results, but it may not matter if you give an H2A result today or tomorrow, right? But there are diseases in the retina where it does matter. Um, and what I'll end with talking about is retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is a, is a devastating disease. Um, you know, it's, it's uncommon, but common enough that we have to um, see it. And what's most important is early screening and genetic diagnosis, because that can save not only the, the eye, but potentially that child because of the extraocular morbidity that comes with metastatic spread. Um, and, you know, we've now applied the same approach to show that we can rapidly call variants of retinoblastoma. Like I mentioned, we can get methylation signals. Um, and, you know, I'm not going into too detail, but we've now started collecting a large cohort to show that we can verify and, and um, 
improve on diagnostics. And the one example I'll show is somatic mutations, so mosaic variants. These are very difficult to detect because they're rare. You know, the variant allele fraction could be quite small. But again, because we're able to get focused depth of sequencing and have high quality reads that span these regions, this is an example where there's a 12% allele fraction that was reported clinically, uh, but this was after eight months of testing. So they initially said negative and then retested and retested a third time. Um, but, you know, we are, we're able to modify our protocol so that we don't throw out all the HEP variants. We look at every variant and then look at anything that can cause a coding uh, termination codon in RB, and we can identify these very quickly. So I think in the future, as this kind of approach evolves, I think the ability to enrich for complex and large ge uh, genomic loci will be integral to identify these missing heritability cases. And also, we'll be able to further diagnose those that remain undiagnosed. Um, like I showed, it can be expanded from one gene to 300 genes to 500 genes. The theoretical limit that we calculate is about 8% of the genome, um, which is a few thousand genes. So this can apply, obviously, to IRDs, but to any Mendelian disease. And I think um, the power of this technique is that we're using the MinIA, which is a very small device. It can be readily used in almost any lab uh, with the computing power behind it to identify this. And I think as we move towards therapy, this will be a key step to do that. Um, you know, it, a lot's changed in the in the last decade since I've been in Chris's lab. Um, and I think I never envisioned long read sequencing as something that I would ever do, um, but it's definitely something that I think is the future. Uh, and just like that, I've Chris was recently in Seattle uh, and he met the two newest lab members of the Mustafi lab, um, my son and daughter. Uh, and, you know, they were thrilled to see Chris and I was thrilled to have him in Seattle uh, last year when he came to give the Krebs lecture at University of Washington. And with that, I just want to end by, you know, thanking people. This is obviously a work that has taken a few years to get started, but really investment from Kenji, who's a bioinformatics um, and Ben scientist in my lab, and Jenna, who's a genetic counselor and Ben scientist, and, you know, our team at University of Washington with Russ and and Jen and Tim, and then uh, our collaborators at UW, Mass Ionero, HSU, and CHLA, and sponsors, especially the KOA from NIH, which allows me to take leaps on long read sequencing and beyond. So thank you for your time. Happy to answer any questions. All right, let's go to uh, Zoom, and maybe the uh, first person will be Radha. Radha, all yours. Good, good. Congratulations, Devishi. It's great presentation. Um, and, and also, like, you know, I really like your uh, IRD panel, which is uh, going to really improve our, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, chances of finding all kinds of mutations that we were not able to find before. So my question is, like, can you comment on uh, what are the limitations of this methodology based on your experience? Yeah, so I think the, the limitations are um, you know, unlike Illumina and, and short read networks, uh, it's not as well developed software wise. Um, so you, it's not something that's plug and play. So I do think it takes a, quite a bit of effort on your part. So you need a deep bioinformatic know-how of how to deal with the errors that come up. Um, but I think, you know, we have, I think successfully solved a lot of those issues um, to make it something that is streamlined. So, and again, it's something that we wanna share and publish and hope more and more people use. Um, and I think the most important part of this whole thing is input DNA. So you need really good, high molecular weight, clean DNA. Um, you can have the best network, the best device, and just have bad sample and get bad results. So I think with good input DNA and you know the pipeline that we've created, I think we have a chance to uh, really do something special. So most of the historical DNA samples which we have, um, what do you think? Like probably like otherwise for other methodologies, we have to get fresh samples. So uh, it's the same here. Yeah, also. so I think uh, his, we've, we've looked at historical DNA and most of the time people have used the, you know, column-based shearing methods. So your DNA from these historical samples are always gonna be smaller, maybe, maybe a thousand <laughs> to a few thousand base pairs. Our high molecular weight DNA, I mean, we have some reads that are a million base pairs long because we do not shear. So um, I would say that to do this really well, you would do a high molecular weight DNA extraction from, from scratch again. Thank you. 
Okay, let's go to Michael. <coughs> Just turning off and turning on. Um, excellent talk, um, uh, Debarshi. Um, we're big fans of um, uh, the uh, Nanopore tech um, here, but we use it for um, RNA sequencing. Um, <laughs> But uh, my, my question was, uh, there's another game in town uh, for long read sequencing, um, uh, Pack Bio. Have you yes. uh, tried that? And can you comment on, on comparison? Yeah, so we have tried it. Pack Bio is a, is a different technique. It uses this thing called um, sequential sequencing. It basically sequencing the same thing over and over again. The downside of Pack Bio is that you cannot target. So ONT is targetable because you have these protein nanopores that are inherently bioinformatically controlled. With PacBio, you are able to do whole genome sequencing runs really well. So you get long reads, but you're going to have the same problem. You're going to get, you know, 100% coverage of genes that you don't need and low coverage of potentially genes that you want. So there's no good targeting, high throughput targeting method there. Um, otherwise, it's a great technique. Um, but because we cannot target, we have not used it as much. Yeah, great. Thanks. Let's go to uh, Brother Anand. Yeah, hi there, Bersi. Wonderful, wonderful talk. I mean, you have, you know, it took some time for you to get started, but I I know you, you will do very well. My question in diagnostics has always been, for research, it's okay. For diagnosis, you have to be at least 99.99% sure before you tell someone that you don't have the disease. And how do you think about sort of, you know, if you, there are two genes in same pathway, say BBS, and you have one mutation in BBS1, the other is in BBS4, the protein interactions or, uh, or in the complex, those could really reduce uh, the function and you may get the disease. So, I mean, we are assuming in all of these situations that there is a single gene uh, mutation that is causal. And that's hard to say since in most cases you now have the singletons or you have very small families where you can't really test that hypothesis that only one gene is involved. And then you have a question of other uh, variants uh, that could be in, in, in regions of uh, uh, sort of enhancers or water promoters and other places. So I, I think are we there yet? I mean, despite all these technologies, I think still we have some more way to go. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think we have a way to go, but we're getting closer and closer. You know, your, your question about enhancers and things like that, you know, that just means covering these regions and actually identifying uh, whether it is an enhancer or not. So I think what this is going to solve is a lot of, if we know something lies in a region that is known disease causing, a giant exon deletion, uh, change in the cis regulatory element, then yes, we can diagnose them. But I think to your point, if it lies in an enhancer, do we know it's disease causing? No, not yet. But we will make that first step of actually identifying it so that we can move to a cell based study. Um, we can't even go in that step right now because we don't know what variant they have. So I think, um, I think your point's well taken, but I think we're still moving further along with each kind of technological improvement. Okay, Vladimir. Adibarashi, very interesting work. My question is maybe naive, but you, uh, you showed a graph with kind of the number of RID mutations that have been identified through the years. So do you think that uh, basically what percentage of unknown mutations do you think are still there that you can pick up with your tools versus what is already known? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've, we've kind of looked at our data just recently to see in, you know, of the patients we've um, identified, and this is obviously very curated, per, uh, uh, cohort, but you know, of the 20 or so that had non-diagnostic results, we're able to return diagnostic results in about um, two thirds of them. So it does improve that second hit, but this is someone who we have a good idea of what's going on. I think the challenge is going to be in those patients that have nothing, even after targeted sequencing, what is going on. Um, and I think, you know, to Anand's point, some of those may not be single gene mutations. They could be enhancer elements, you know, they could be diagenic, um, there could be a lot of other things going on, but I think um, it, we're moving closer and closer to giving better diagnosis. But I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're ever going to get to 100. percent I think you know we're we're never going to be that good, but uh, better than you know 60 percent is probably 
uh, what we should shoot for, 70, 80, 90. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's go to Zach. Thank you for that really interesting talk. So I kind of always perceive karyotyping as being very archaic, but is there still a place for karyotyping coupled with like conversation techniques, maybe as like a control template um, for like allele specific template enrichment? Or yeah. Something like that, or is it just completely eclipsed? No, I think karyotyping has a very important role. We had a, a case where um, a patient had retinoblastoma <laughs> and a lot of other findings. And the karyotype led us in the correct direction because it showed a balanced translocation between X and 13. But so, it's predominantly for translocation events? Predominantly, or? yes. Okay. Um, I, you just don't get the resolution with karyotyping to identify these smaller changes. Um, so I think for that, you would do this. But I think for larger things that you cannot explain or have multiple facets of disease, karyotyping has a very incredible role. Thank you, Sam. Hey, uh, great talk. Um, so when you're calling your variance, uh, can this be automated in some way or are you still having to go in and kind of call them by hand? No, it's automated. So the pipeline we've developed um, and use, we use deep learning tools. So the way we call uh, variance is with a, a tool called pepper margin deep variant. It reduces your heterozygous problem into homozygous problem and then produces your phase VCF. And then we feed it into a CAD a scoring algorithm, which is com combined annotation dependent depletion score, but it tells you supposed ranked uh, levels of pathogenicity or deleteriousness. So at the end of the day, we have an output file that is phased with variance um, with a kind of tiered ranking score. And it also, we have incorporated ClinVar scores and allelic frequencies, so we can then filter by pathogenic variance, you know, rare variance and everything like that to get a very quick answer. Our goal is to make a deep learning framework to give you an answer. Uh, to do that, we need about 200 or so patient, you know, normal in control to feed it data and then train it on a different set. Um, so the way, you know, these tools work is that you need a big diverse uh, learning network or learning uh, tool set, and then you should train it ideally on a completely separate tool set, right? So um, we're, we're in the process of doing that. IRDs are rare. So we have accumulated about a few hundred in uh, University of Washington, but always look for more. So if more people want to contribute samples, we're happy to take them on. John? Oh, yeah. Great talk. Um, so I know that all of these panels cover quite a wide range of, or net of genes. Um, are there, uh, and, and I know, understand IRDs are quite rare, but are there genes that have not yet is this tool that you've described good for gene discovery, IRD gene discovery, or? It is in the sense that, um, well, you're only gonna discover variants in genes that you target. So uh, th there's a caveat there, but you know, we have not, the, the number is kind of plateaued off. It's not like we're discovering a new IRD gene every year, but we are discovering new variants in these genes. So I think what a lot of people have thought is that it's not that there are more genes out there that are causing IRDs, it's more variants in these genes that we have to understand. So from that standpoint, I think it's good for very discovery. Now, same problem with the panel is if we design a panel and it's outside of our panel, this variant, we're not gonna discover it either. Um, but our thought process is if it is negative, you can always go to whole genome sequencing down the line, but this gives you a targeted look very quickly. Okay, uh, Caroline. Hey, Dr. Musafi, great talk. Uh, so my question is more about your reference database, so your assembly. Do you envision you moving towards like even using the telomeres to telomere assembly just so you can get a broader exchange capacity to detect those structural variants or maybe collecting more of diverse haplotypes just from different populations because of migration uh, that happens so you can expand your non-diagnostic results more broad? Yeah, so the Caroline brings a great point is that right now we're using the uh, genome 38 build, which is you know inherently the same problem with 37 and all these things. But there are a few new assemblies that have come out. One is the T to T, T to telomere telomere, which is a combination of long read and short read sequencing. And then the other one is the PN genome, which has incorporated multiple genomes, right? Um, and we, our goal is to use that. The downside of incorporating these new genomes is that every tool out there is designed for um, genome build 38. So we will have to adapt our tools as they come out. Uh, but the goal is to incorporate those. The other problem with structural variants is that we, we know a lot about single nucleotide variants and coding variants, we know very little about structural variants, right? So even when we find one, we don't know if it's, you know, if there's a 
huge insertion in the intronic region, is that disease causing or not? I think it goes to Anand's point. We have to then do the Excel work to figure that out, but identifying that is the first step. And then there are built, you know, Nomad and all these other places are building structural variant collar or regions for us to understand, and that'll be the next step. But great point. Dr. Skowlanska Krawczyk. Hi, um, this very, very interesting talk. And actually, I, I see use, for example, in some uh, faraway places where the other technologies are not available. So that's a really, really nice uh, approach. Uh, thank you for sharing it with us. I have a question about the um, cell type specific uh, gene activation and gene methylation and so on. How do you plan to? I'm sure you are thinking about it. How yes. do you plan to address it? And uh, what's the kind of next step towards this direction? Yeah, so I think, you know, obviously our, our data from blood is not going to give you that cell specific understanding. Um, you know, we're first approaching it for retinoblastoma because it is a whole body cancer to look at the methylation profile in that. Uh, but then ultimately, you're going to have to go to patient derived stem cells to really understand what's going on in a specific cell type. You know, we are not going to take someone's retinas out to understand their cell type, but we can grow, you know, surrogate tissue, or um, if it is possible to get surrogate tissue from different organ systems, that can easily be done to look at cell specific profiling. Very nice. Very nice talk. Um, could you comment on how you envision these new targeted diagnostic approaches could ultimately be leveraged to improve clinical outcomes? Um, you know, for instance, with uh, the development of more targeted gene therapies in contrast to pharmacological interventions that might be mutation independent. Yeah, so, um, you know, right now when we order testing, we order panel testing, right? And what, I, what we envision is this replaces that panel test, right? So if you want to test an IRD panel, you don't have to test the coding regions and a few select non-coding regions, you can select, okay, I want to test this panel of 300 so genes, I'm going to do a targeted way with long read. I'm going to get phase information. I'm going to do all that in a uh, rapid format. The biggest hurdle is that the there's only one device that's currently getting CLIA approval from ONT. Once that is CLIA approved, we'll be able to move forward with that. Um, but we've also investigated other avenues to make a CLIA approved lab in our setting to return genetic results. But ultimately, the goal will be to hopefully move away from short read panel based sequencing to long read sequencing. Um, to provide a depth of information that we cannot get right now. All right, let's move then to Andrew. Barsha, really great talk. Thank you so much. So um, you, you indicated that you can selectively target specific genes that you think have a high probability. And I know that at UW, UW you have Aaron Lee, who's an incredible with the uh, image processing and machine learning to predict, make predictions. Yeah. So do you foresee that you could take a 12 hour test and turn it into a one-hour test if you use some pre-test probability approval? Absolutely. So uh, Andrew makes a great point. So if when you, a lot of these times, although we do not know the gene ideology, we can narrow it down, right? To 10, 20, 30 genes. Uh, and the question is, can we then sequence those more enriched? And yes, and I think we can do that. There's a, there's a new method that has been developed called, uh, that's a tweak of the current um, adaptive sampling where it basically, you're able to do adaptive sampling. And then when, it, when you change the target on the fly, you say, oh, look, I found a variant in Rhodopsin. Just sequence Rhodopsin. It'll basically do that on the fly. Um, so run boss method developed by Matthew Luce, but it basically will narrow down your adaptive profile even further once you get your first answer. Um, we have not used it yet with Aaron Lee. Uh, the other thing that Nanopore does is it makes a decision point after about 800 or 900 bases, that's two seconds, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that is a lot of time of sampling DNA. Uh, and we figured out that we can narrow that time down to less than a millisecond because we can scan DNA in 30 to 50 base pairs and make a decision. Um, and that's gonna increase your enrichment by tenfold. Um, so when you make that decision, you'll be able to make that decision even sooner. So yeah, I think that's a great point to move forward to get an even more closer, di faster diagnosis on this. All right, this was really fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Debashi. And we have a one more question going to Dominic, and you'll be free. Uh, and the uh, uh, verdict is you pass. Thank you. It's, mm -hmm. it's the first time you said that. So, <laughs> uh, so this is a great tool that you developed, and I have a question. Can you uh, basically um, uh, change the setup to, for example, for the research purposes, to use it uh, to study 
mutations in uh, mouse or other uh, mammals uh, than human? Absolutely. Yeah. So you can, um, what, what is going to be your limiting factor is what your input is and what your reference is, right? So mouse also has a really good reference. So, you know, we do that a lot. There are a lot of people use this for metagenomics to look at bacterial and viral DNA. So as long as you have a good reference, this tool is adaptable quite, quite a bit. So I think it would be great for that as well. Renata, you have one more question, it looks like, or am I wrong? Yes. Uh, how easy it is to add more genes to your uh, IRD panel? A um, few minutes. Yeah, because it, it, oh. it is a, uh, all we have to do is re, re, uh, redo the bed file that we put in for the targeting. So, you know, let's say we have a panel of 300 genes and you come back and say, I really want these five more genes. Um, we could do it as the sequencing experiment is even being run. Um, it's, it's very simple. And I think that's what separates us from the other techniques is that we don't use any hybridization, anything like that. It's simply bioinformatic input from our standpoint. Oh, okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right, let's thank Dr. Bashi.